Hi, and uh, welcome to this next video on neural nets, where we're going to take a, a first look at how to train these neural networks. So I guess in the last couple of videos, we introduced the basics of neural networks, in particular, uh, what they look like, the architecture, the general picture that you see here with neurons, weights on the edges, and activation functions on the nodes. In particular, we looked at these feed-forward neural networks that are basically directed acyclic graphs. Uh, where the input comes in here at the bottom and some output is produced at the top here. So what we're going to look at in this video is uh, the basic algorithm for training such a neural net. Uh, so, so let's have a closer look, right? So in one of the previous videos, we already mentioned that the training of such neural nets will be based on this stochastic gradient descent algorithm that we already saw in, in previous videos, in particular for logistic regression. And we also looked at it briefly for uh, linear regression as, a, as an alternative training algorithm. Okay, the nice thing about uh, minibad stochastic gradient descent is that the algorithm for that you that you need to implement it's basically a template that works for almost all kinds of uh, training problems where you want to minimize the loss function. The only thing that you need to be able to do is that you need to be able to compute the gradient of the loss function with respect to some trainable parameters or weights. So. Uh, of course, you could then ask, you know, in the previous, at least for linear regression, logistic regression, we said that these loss functions, uh, when you have these linear models, turn out to be convex functions. And this means that there was only one uh, local minima, so there's only the global minima, there's no local maxima, no saddle points, which means the gradient descent always walks towards this global minimum, minimizing the, the loss function to, to perfection in some sense. So <clears throat> the issue with uh, neural nets is that when we plug in a loss function and the evaluation of a neural net, as we'll see later, uh, it's not going to be a convex function. So, so there's not going to be just one uh, minimum. There can be many of them, right? So you're not guaranteed to find a global minimum when you do gradient descent. So this might, of course, be, be a worry. So what do we do? Uh, so the picture could look something like this, right? There can be multiple uh, valleys here. So if we start gradient descent, the basic idea was to start somewhere and then just roll downhill until you reach the minimum. Now, if there are multiple of them, right, we might end up in a suboptimal minimum. Right? We might end up here instead of down here, where it's the loss function that's plotted on the y-axis. So the loss might be much higher than, than what we could potentially do. Now, the thing with neural nets is that it just turns out that in practice, local minima are just good enough, right? So if you just go to one of these local minima, you're actually going to do uh, well on the training data. And, and, uh, and so this is suffices. So that's the basic idea. Just you don't care about reaching the global minima, you're just gonna minimize the loss function using gradient descent, end up in some local minima, and then hopefully this is a good enough local minima. Okay, so that's the basic idea. Now, stochastic gradient descent, this was the template that we that we saw before, right? So uh, it basically works for any point-wise loss function where we have an in-sample error, that's the average over uh, all the training examples of a loss function applied to the prediction made by the model and on this feature vector xi. Uh, and the true label yi. And the algorithm was basically doing, you initialize these weights that are part of this uh, model. So, so this w of xi is some model that has weights uh, w that can be trained. So for neural nets, it would be all the biases and all the weights of the neural net. You initialize them somehow, and then uh, you run through these epochs so while you have more time, you permute all the training data. Uh, you run through it in batches of b training examples. So you take the next b uh, items in your training data set, and you kind of pretend these are your only uh, training examples in the sense that you compute uh, the average of the gradient on uh, of the loss function where you apply it to all of these training examples. You take the current model, you make a prediction on each of these training examples and uh, plug in also the true label into this loss function. You take the gradient, you average it, and this becomes your, your gradient. You then update your weights by taking a small step in the negative direction of this gradient. Right? That's the basic gradient descent algorithm. And up here, right, this W of xi is just supposed to be the output that the neural net produces when the weights and the biases are what they what they currently are. And so these are part of this, this model here. Okay, so what we see here is really that all we need to be able to compute is this, this gradient here for a single training examples, uh, the, the application of the loss function onto the prediction made by the, the model, the neural net, uh, and the true label. Okay. So... So these, this is, again, one of these feed-forward neural nets, right? So somehow the evaluation of this network is part of this, uh, is, is plugged into the loss function. 
So then we want to compute gradients with respect to all these weights that are sitting somewhere inside of this neural net here, and at least nonlinear activation functions and so on. So how can we actually compute all these gradients, right? It's not at all clear uh, how we can compute them. So this is the focus of this video, how we can compute gradients for such a general thing as a neural net. And to do that, we're going to use uh, a very popular algorithm known as backpropagation, and sometimes backprop just for short. And it's a, it's a very fast algorithm for computing gradients uh, of basically an arbitrary computation. It doesn't have to be a neural net, but for general uh, computations, you can uh, compute gradients uh, using this backprop algorithm. So we'll spend the rest of the video uh, explaining this backpropagation algorithm. Okay. So to explain it, we first need to talk about what is a computation graph. This is basically the input to backpropagation. And so we'll have a closer look at what that, that is and connect it to these neural nets. Okay. So a computation graph uh, could look something like this. So in the graph, there are some nodes here at the bottom. These are the input nodes. And you have one of those nodes for every variable that is part of the computation. So in this computation here, you have x1, x2, y, and z. And then you have internal nodes. And each of these internal nodes of the computation graph, they perform some computation, a simple step. For instance, this node here computes the product of the two inputs. The node over here computes the sum. The node up here computes the product of the two inputs. And this one uh, computes e to the input. Okay, And in this computation graph, it's an acyclic graph. So all the edges point forward. There are no cycles. And so, so here, right, the, this graph, the, the computation it would be performing is the following. right? So this node here will compute the product of its two inputs and forward it along the outgoing edge, which means it will compute x1 times x2. Over here, you'd compute the sum of the two inputs. So this would forward y plus z along the edge. This node up here now receives x1 times x2 as the one input and y plus z as the other input. It computes the product so and then forwards it. So that's x1 times x2 times the sum of y and z. And finally, the output node here uh, takes e to the input. So the whole function here, this whole graph, is really computing e to the x1 times x2 times the sum of y plus z and z. Okay, so this is a computation graph. And uh, maybe we should first see that these computation graphs uh, can really kind of mimic a, a feed-forward neural net. Right? So over here on the left, we have a feed-forward neural network. Uh, we have two uh, input features that are coming in. For now, I just simplified a little bit. There's no bias neuron, just to make it a little bit simpler. In the middle, you have a, a ReLU activation neuron. And up here, right, you have an identity activation neuron. It weights on the edges. So what would be the corresponding computation graph? So uh, I claim that this is, this is uh, the computation graph. And let's try to see that this is what's happening. OK, so what we can see here is that here, well, First, we have to compute what is actually that is uh, what is the signal that comes into this node. So, if you remember, the signal that comes into a neuron is the uh, you look at all the incoming edges, you take the weight and multiply it with the incoming value. So, here you have w1 times x1 plus w2 times x2. So, what we see is that we need to actually compute w1 times x1. So, this is what this uh, lower left neuron uh, node here in the computation graph is doing is computing the product of w1 and x1. We also need to compute the, w, the product of w2 and x2. This is what this other uh, node here is doing. It's computing the product of x2 and w2. Then we need to sum them up. So, the sum of w1 and x1 plus w2, x2, that's the signal that comes into uh, this neuron here. So, this is basically the, the output of this edge up here. Then the neuron computes the ReLU activation, which is the max of 0 and x. So this is what is being done up here. Then this has to be multiplied with W4 on this edge here, right? So this is what this node up here in the computation graph is doing. It's multiplying the output of this ReLU function with W4. And finally, uh, the identity function here is it's really computing, well, it's, it's taking W3 times one. So it's just W3 and it's adding it with W4 times uh, ReLU. So this is what's being done up here at the, at the top node here. It's taking W3 and it's adding it with uh, the output of the ReLU times W4. Right. So this is the computation graph corresponding to the evaluation of this feedforward neural network. And I hope it's clear that you can just get test, take any arbitrarily large uh, feedforward neural net and you can uh, construct the corresponding computation graph. And it could be much bigger than the, than the neural net itself. But this is the computation graph. <clears throat> OK. So. What we want to do now is that we want a general algorithm for computing gradients if I have such a computation graph. Okay, so again, uh, the inputs here, now when we want to compute gradients, 
for such a computation graph. Uh, the idea is that we, we get some input for the values of all the, the input variables, and we only want to compute the gradient at the current uh, set of parameters. We just want to evaluate the gradient at this set of uh, input values. Okay, so let's try to see what that means. So to do this, uh, I guess the clearest, the easiest thing is to actually see what the algorithm is doing. So uh, to, to actually find out what the gradient is in the current uh, set of, of values, we need to, we will not compute an explicit formula for the gradient, right? Because that can actually become really, really large. You could maybe even have exponential size and the size of this computation graph for some uh, examples. So we're not gonna write down an explicit formula for, for the gradient. Instead, we're gonna do algorithmic, we're gonna make sure that we just evaluate it at the current set of, uh, of input values. Okay, so, so let's try to see what that um, means. So the basic idea is that let's say we want to evaluate the gradient at the current set of uh, parameters, uh, x1 being five, x2 being two, y being minus one and z being one. So we wanna evaluate the gradient at this set of parameters. So what we do first is what we call the forward pass. And here we just uh, run through this computation graph and evaluate it. So we actually just compute the output of the function that this computation graph represents. So we're gonna just gonna see what happens here, right? These input values are forwarded along the edges of the graph. Now the first node here computes the product of five and two, so it's gonna forward 10. The other uh, node here is gonna compute the sum of minus one and one, so it's gonna forward zero. Then this node is gonna compute the product of zero and 10, so it's gonna forward zero. This is gonna forward e to the zero, so it's gonna output one. So this is the forward pass. It's very intuitive. You just evaluate the computation graph going forward. Now, the important thing here is that we're going to store all these intermediate results on, on these edges. We're just gonna keep them uh, with, as part of this algorithm that we're, we're running. So we're gonna keep all those intermediate results. Now, here comes the backward pass, and this is the, the interesting and non-trivial part of, uh, of this backpropagation algorithm, right? So this whole thing here, the computation graph, really represents a function of x1, x2, y, and z. Right. This is what the whole thing does. It, it's just a function of x1, x2, y, and z. And what we'd like to do now is we'd like to compute the partial derivative of this function uh, with respect to one of these variables that comes in, say, for instance, with respect to y. And we just want to evaluate it here at the current set of values, x1, x2, y, and z. So we don't want to write up a formula for this gradient. We just want to actually get the numeric value of the gradient at the current set of parameters. And this is the important part, right? We're not going to write out an explicit formula. We just want to know what is the value of this gradient at the current set of uh, parameters. So let's see how we can actually compute that. So the easiest thing is to say, okay, let's give all these non-leaf nodes a name, right? So maybe we can call the top one F and maybe this node, the output of this node is G, the output of this node is H, the output of this node is I. So just give them names that are different from these input variables. And right, so these can be th thought of as functions as well, like G, the output G here is basically the function corresponding to the computation graph beneath it, right? And H is the function basically X1 times X2. And I is the function Y plus set, right? So each of these represent the function in the computation graph beneath. F is the full function, of course. Now, so what we can see here is as a computation graph, you can also write all of these functions as a function of the inputs. So for instance, this f, even though it's a function of all the, the variables down at the bottom, you could also write it as e being e to the g, right? So g is what comes in, it computes e to the g. Similarly, you can write g as the product of h and i. You can write h as the product of x1 and x2, and you can write i as y plus z. Right? So this is what we're gonna do, right? We're just gonna write down all of these, uh, inner, the functions that have been computed as function of just the incoming uh, values. And these are functions themselves until this bottoms out at the, uh, when everything is just uh, input variables. So now we've written down all these uh, intermediate results as, as functions of the, the incoming values. Okay, so let's again try to see if we can compute the partial derivative of f with respect to y. So how can we do this? So maybe if we start a little bit simpler and we say, okay, what if I just want to compute the partial derivative of f with respect to g? Right, so, so just with respect to the incoming value. Maybe this is easier, right, because, um, right, so G, F is e to the G, right? And so what is this function, right? So F is e to the G, which means that the partial derivative of F with respect to G is e to the G, 
now, as you can see here, and we just want to evaluate it at the current set of values, right? So e to the g, the interesting thing is that this is already computed, right? Because during the forward pass, we know what g is, right? Because we basically this is what we wrote on this edge here, right? Every one of these edges in the, in the computation graph, the value that we start is the value, for instance, of h at the current set of uh, parameters. This is the value of i at the current set of parameters. The value of g at the current set of parameters is zero, which means that at the current set of parameters, we just need to evaluate e to the zero, so we get one. So the partial derivative of f with respect to g is just one. Okay, so we can actually compute the partial derivative of f with respect to g. So now we know that this is this is one. So let's write that on the edge here as well, the edge that represents the g function. Now you can also ask, you know, what about the partial derivative of f with respect to i? So we're going one step further down the computation graph. Right, so this is basically like the the with respect to the value that's coming along uh, this edge here. Now, f is not a, directly a function of i, right? F we wrote it as e to the g. What we can do here is that we can use the chain rule, right? Because this is a composite function. So maybe uh, this is a, a slightly different way of writing the chain rule, uh, but it is the same as the one we've been using before. If we want to do the partial derivative of f with respect to i, I can do the partial derivative of f with respect to g and multiply with the partial derivative of g with respect to i. The, the simplest way to remember this is kind of, you can just kind of look at this expression here and see that you kind of split it into two fractions, uh, the partial derivative of f with respect to one and the partial derivative, uh, and one divided by the partial derivative of, or the partial derivative of i here. So basically write it as uh, this uh, this fraction here where I multiply and, and divide by uh, by g here. So the partial derivative of f with respect to g and the partial derivative of g with respect to i. So, so you can kind of see if you just multiply out the g's, you get the same formula. This is, I guess, the easiest way to remember this. So <clears throat> the nice thing about this is that we already just computed the partial derivative of f with respect to g, right? This is what we have on this edge. We know it's one at the current set of values. So we already know that this is one. And now uh, we only have left to compute the partial derivative of g with respect to i. But the nice thing here is that now g is a function directly of i, right? Uh, whereas f wasn't. So g was exactly the product of h and i. This is a simple expression, right? It's as easy to compute the partial derivative of this with respect to i. It's just h, right? And we need to evaluate this expression at the current set of parameters. So we need to know what is h. But h is written exactly on this edge over here, right? We computed it during the forward pass. h is just 10 at the current set of parameters. So we can just plug in 10 here. And so if we plug in 10, then we get uh, one times 10. So the partial derivative of f with respect to i is just 10 because we have 10 already written on, on the z here. So now we have computed this partial derivative up here, the partial derivative of f with respect to i. So this allowed us to take one step further back in the computation graph. And now we can repeat this, right? So now we know I wanna know what's the partial derivative of f with respect to y, which is the value here at the z. And we're gonna do the chain rule again. This time, uh, the kind of intermediate step is the node i here. So we're gonna do the partial derivative of f with respect to i times the partial derivative of i with respect to y. And again, the easy way to remember it is that you can see that these two cancel out, like the, the i's kind of cancel out if you multiply the two. So, uh, so this is what we're going to, to do here. Now, the nice thing is we just computed the partial derivative of f with respect to i, right? This is what we just wrote on this edge. It's the 10 up there. So the 10 we already have. And now the second one here is the partial derivative of i with respect to y. And again, right here, we know that i is a function directly of y. So in particular, i is the function y plus z. So this is an easy function again to compute the partial derivative with respect to y for, it's just one, right? So if you plug in a one here, you get a 10 and we're done, right? So the partial derivative of f with respect to y is 10. So that was using just the chain rule. You can kind of trace this whole path backwards, uh, starting at the top and each time computing one more of these partial derivatives. Okay, so the general algorithm really, if you want to cook down or boil down what we just did is that the general back propagation algorithm is you have the forward pass where you compute and store values of all the nodes, right? So you compute kind of the output of all the nodes, you compute them and store them. And then, the back propagation says that, um, that we're going to compute all these partial derivatives uh, 
or of the function f with respect to all these intermediate outputs by starting at the top and then going uh, back downwards through the computation graph. That's why it's called the backwards pass. So if there's some node x up here, you compute the path derivative of f with respect to x. You trace it further down. At some point, you're going to compute the path derivative of f with respect to c. You're going to compute the path derivative of f with respect to a, and so on. And so let's say you traced it all the way down here, right? And in red, you've already written these values. You computed the exact value of the path derivative of f with respect to c. Now, if I want to compute now the path derivative of f with respect to a, I use the chain rule and write it as the path derivative of f with respect to c times the path derivative of c with respect to a. Again, the rate to remember is that these two cancel out. Now, the partial derivative of f with respect to c, uh, we already know, right, because we just computed it. It's what's written here in red. It's written on the output edge. So this you can just plug in. We already know it. Now, the good thing here is that the c function now is a direct function of a and b, right? It's some function phi of the incoming values. So this is a simple function that you can actually compute the partial derivative with respect to a of this function. So you just do it and you already know the value of a. This gives some function. You can just write down an analytic expression and you know the values a and b so you can evaluate this analytic expression uh, and just plug it in, right? So we already computed the partial derivative with respect to c. Uh, this is a simple function. Uh, it's a function of a and b and those are known. The values of a and b are known from the forward pass. So you can just plug them in and evaluate this analytic expression that you get, which allows us to take one more step so for instance, right, if this function here is the product function, so phi is a times b, then the partial derivative of a times b with respect to a is just b. And we have the b from the forward pass, so we can just take b times this uh, value that we already computed uh, up here. So we just can compute it numerically. Right, this is just because the partial derivative of a times b with respect to a is just b. We also do the sum function, right? So let's say this was the sum a plus b, then we're just going to get the path derivative of f with respect to c because, well, the function here is a plus b. That's the function that's being computed. So the path derivative of this with respect to a is just 1. So we do 1 times the path derivative of f with respect to c according to the chain rule. And, you know, maybe if you want to do this as a, as a general rule that on every edge uh, you want to just take the, if you want to compute it, you have to look at the path derivative of the function here with respect to the output of the function with respect to that that incoming value on the edge and multiply it with the red value that you the possibility you just computed on the outgoing edge then i guess the rule to get started is that this is just one here okay so maybe maybe you don't need it if you if you think uh, about it you can just directly compute the first one you could also do it generically and say that yeah you always put the value one on this one on this the final output edge okay so <clears throat> this is basically uh, the algorithm right um when we want to compute the path derivative of f with respect to a down here, we're going to use the, the value we computed on the edge above and multiply it with how uh, you compute the analytic expression for this simple function of a and b and evaluate it at the current values a and b that we know from the forward pass. Okay, there's one special rule to remember, otherwise we're actually done with the backpropagation algorithm. We've said all the things that need to be say, said. And the thing is that uh, if you ever encounter in this computation graph, you have a node whose output is sent to multiple destinations, right? Then uh, when we do this back propagation, right, we keep going backwards, always picking one of the edges uh, that we haven't yet computed the partial derivative with respect to. And it's always one that, that enters one of the nodes where we have the partial derivative of the outgoing edge. So if we keep tracing this uh, backwards, there might be, if we get to some node here that has multiple outgoing edges, so it's sending its output to multiple locations, then each of those locations would compute, say, a partial derivative on each of those edges, right? So you're going to get one on each of them. Intuitively, with the notation before, we'll call these the partial derivative of f with respect to c. But actually, they're not really. Uh, the, the special rule to remember is just whenever you have something that's being sent to multiple destinations, you will, by running the backward propagation algorithm, you'll get a value on each of those edges. And you have to sum them uh, when you go further down. You have to use the sum of them as the as the the partial derivative of f with respect to c. Okay, so that's just a rule to remember. So let's just uh, run this example. So here's a complicated expression. Uh, it's taking relo as a max of zero, and inside it has x one times x two, and it has uh, uh, added with w one times w two, and then finally you add this whole thing with e to the w one times w two. 
we can draw a computation graph for this expression, right? We have x1 times x2 down here. We have w1 times w2. We add them up. Uh, we take the max of zero and this value. And over here, we also have e2, this product of w1 times w2. We add it all up at the end and output it. So, so the special thing here, of course, with this computation graph is that this product of w1 and w2 is sent to two different locations. So let's try to actually run this backpropagation algorithm on, on this example, right? So let's start by putting all the values. Uh, let's say we want to evaluate the some of the partial derivatives at the set of values where x1 is 4, x2 is 2, w1 is 2, and w2 is 0. So we send these values along the outgoing edges, and we start evaluating the node. So here we have to compute the product. We get an 8. Here we have to compute the product. We get a 0. It's sent on both the outgoing edges. Here we have to sum them. We get an 8. Over here, we have to do e to the 0. We get a 1. Max of zero and eight is eight. Here we sum them and get a nine. Okay, so that was the forward pass. This was the easy thing. And now let's try to do the, the backwards pass. So let's give all of these internal nodes names. So F, E, C, A, B, and D. And uh, so let's go through it, right? So we start by this, this rule that on the out edge here, we're just going to write a one. So, so let's put a one on this one just to get started. And then we can do the remaining ones. So if we just, in general, plug in the rule when we want to compute the partial derivative with respect to one of these functions, so for instance, the e function here, which is the value on the, the edge here, then we always take uh, the node above, that's the f node, so we do the partial derivative of f with respect to f. In this the case, it's trivial, So, it, but we always just take this value on the out edge here of the, of the node above it. So we, we have the one here, and now uh, we have to plug in what is this function here. Right, the, the function f is e plus d, okay? And we have to compute the partial derivative with respect to e. That's just one. So we're gonna put a one on this edge here. Okay, now let's continue. So let's look at this edge over here. Uh, the chain rule again is a little special when we get started here because it's kind of maybe not meaningful to do the partial derivative of f with respect to f, but just to follow the same general template, uh, let's do this, right? We have this edge. We take the partial derivative with respect to the top of the edge, the f node. Uh, and we also do the partial derivative of this top node with respect to the bottom node of the edge here, the partial derivative f with respect to d. This one is just a one, so you take the value one up here. The function is again e plus d, you do the partial derivative with respect to d, that's one, so you get a one. Okay, so far so good. Now, over here, it gets more interesting, right? We have to compute the partial derivative of f with respect to this node c down here, right? So what we do is, of course, we're gonna write uh, this partial derivative as the partial derivative of f with respect to the parent node here, so the e node, the partial derivative of f with respect to e, and then we're going to write the partial derivative of e with respect to c. And so that's a general template. We take the, the function just above. Because now we already have the partial derivative of f with respect to e. That's what's written on the edge up here. It's a 1. So we have the 1. And now we have to look at the partial derivative of the uh, max of 0 and c function with respect to c. Now, this is a kind of strange function to compute derivatives of, but if you think about it, the max of zero and c function is a function that's flat. It's zero all the way up to c equals zero. And from there on, it, it grows linearly as just c. So this function here uh, is just, it's going to take the value one whenever c is greater than zero, and it's going to take the value zero whenever c is less than or equal to zero. Right? This is a special case exactly when c is zero. We can just ignore it for now and say that the gradient is zero at zero. Okay, so so basically this this the, this partial derivative with respect to c is just the indicator function for whether c is greater than zero, and now we have to plug in the current value of c, right? And the current value of c we have that available from the forward pass, right? So the current value of c is eight, right? It's written on this edge from the forward pass. So we plug in eight into this expression is eight greater than zero, and if it is, we, we get the value one. So indeed it is, and we get the value one here. Okay. Good. So let's try to move further down. Let's compute uh, the partial derivative with respect to a down here. So a's parent node is the c function here. So it's the partial derivative of f with respect to c times the partial derivative of c with respect to a. We already computed this partial derivative with respect to c. Up here, it's 1. And now we have to compute the partial derivative of, of uh, c with respect to a. So c is the a plus b function. So this is just going to be a one if we do the partial derivative with respect to b. So this is easy again. We get a one down here. Okay. Uh, let's also try to do the 
partial derivative here with respect to B, but let's say we started this parent node. So this is a special case, right? B is a branching node. It goes into multiple locations. So we take both of its parents, the ones that are sitting above it, where its output is fed into. So here we're going to do a, choose this parent here. So we do the partial derivative of F with respect to C. That's this node over here times the partial derivative of C with respect to B. So uh, the partial derivative of F with respect to C, we have it on this edge. It's a one. And C is again the A plus B function. So the partial derivative of that with respect to B is one. So we have a one on this edge here. Similarly, like we pick the other edge over here on the other side, and we see that okay, this edge goes to the D node. So we do the partial derivative of F with respect to D times the partial derivative of D with respect to B. Now <clears throat> we have to see what is the partial derivative with respect to D. We already have that computed. It's just the value one that we have up here. Now the D function is e to the b, right? That's what it computes as a function of b. It's e to the b. So we do the partial derivative of e with respect to b, uh, e to the b with respect to b. That is just e to the b. And we have to evaluate it at the current set of values, right? So we have to figure out what is b. Now b, you can see again from the forward pass, it's written on this edge. So it's zero. So we plug in zero. So it's one times e to the zero, which is one. So this is also a one on this node here, on this edge, sorry. And now we have to remember this special rule, right? When we, when we have multiple edges leaving a node, we just have to sum them. So really, when we're going further down the computation graph, uh, this B, the partial derivative of F with respect to B is actually going to be two. So let's go down to W1 here, the partial derivative of F with respect to W1. We have a look at the edge, it goes to the B node. So we do the partial derivative of F with respect to B times the partial derivative of B with respect to W1. The partial derivative of F with respect to B, we just computed it, it's two, right? So here it's important we summed it. So we have a two. And uh, then we do uh, the partial derivative of, well, the B function is W1 times W2, right? So the partial derivative of W1 times W2 with respect to W1, that's just W2. So it's 2W2. We know W2 from the forward pass. It's written on this edge. It's zero. So we just get zero. All right. Similarly, we can do the partial derivative of F with respect to W2. It's we again the W2, this edge goes to B. So it's the partial derivative of F with respect to B times the partial derivative of B with respect to W2. We plug in the two. We have to do the partial derivative of W1, W2 with respect to W2. That's W1. We have W1 available from the forward pass. It's two. So the, the whole expression becomes four. So there's four on this edge. Finally, let's do the last two over here, right? So the partial derivative of F with respect to X1, the outgoing edge goes to A. So we do the partial derivative of F with respect to A times the partial derivative of A with respect to X1. We already know the partial derivative of A with respect to A. It's one, it's written up here. So it's one times, and now we write out what is the A expression. It's X1 times X2. With respect to X1, that's just X2. X2 is two, we know that from the forward pass. So we get a two here. Finally, the partial derivative of f with respect to x2 is the partial derivative of f with respect to a times the partial derivative of a with respect to x2. We have the partial derivative of a with respect to a, that's one. Uh, it's already here, it's written. And the expression x1, x2 with respect to x2, that's just x1. We know x1 from the forward pass, it's four. And so we're done. All right, so this actually is a full execution of this backpropagation algorithm on, on this example computation graph. Okay. Now, as you can see, right, this was just purely mechanical, right? So we can kind of write down a Python program that's kind of doing this. So the forward pass would just be, well, in this example, we set the variables. X1 is four, X2 is two, W1 is two, W2 is zero. And we kind of could write it up as A is X1 times X2, B is W1 times W2, C is the sum A plus B, E is the maximum of uh, zero and C. And D is the exponential function applied to B. And F is the sum of E and D. If you do the back propagation step, <clears throat> you can kind of start up here. Partial derivative of F with respect to F, I guess it's one, if you want to compute this. Uh, the partial derivative of F with respect to E and with respect to D, I guess it's the sum function. So I guess here we just hard code it's one. We already know it's one. Now we can start doing these kind of back propagation steps, right? So we can do what is the partial derivative of D with respect to B? Well, D is the exponential function. So we, we know that the, this is also the exponential function. We just have to evaluate it at B. And we the interesting thing when we write it in code, right? B is already stored up here from the forward pass. It's already stored in a variable. So we can just evaluate this expression. Right, the partial derivative of F with respect to B now by the chain rule is the partial derivative of F with respect to D times the partial derivative of D with respect to B. You can also go over here and compute the partial derivative of E with respect to C. Uh, so this is, 
I guess we, we already saw it, right? This the partial derivative of this max function is one if c is greater than zero, and otherwise it's zero. So we can do it like this, and c again is stored from the forward pass. So so this is okay, you can evaluate this, and now we can do the partial derivative f with respect to c is just the product of these two partial derivatives with respect to e and this partial derivative of, d with, of e with respect to c. And we can do this, the partial derivative of C with respect to A and B, they're both just one because it's a sum function. You can use the chain rule. Here it's a special case, the partial derivative of F with respect to B. The second time we get to it, <clears throat> we have to sum them, right? Because it uh, they, they had these two outgoing edges. Right? So uh, so we have to, we already computed it up here, right? Uh, so, so we just sum them up the second time that we compute partial derivative with respect to B. And so on, right? So this is just all mechanically executing exactly those steps that we were doing manually in the forward pass. And you can see if you run this this code here, you get exactly those values that w1 is the partial derivative with respect to w1 is going to be zero. That's the one you see on the edge here. Partial derivative with respect to w2 is going to be four. We can see it here on the edge. Partial derivative with respect to x1 is going to be two, as you can see on the edge here, and the partial derivative with respect to x2 is going to be four. So it's a completely mechanical procedure where you just uh, do the forward pass, store the values as we did up here in the code, and do the backwards part uh, uh, pass just using, using these chain rules and, and analytic expressions for these simple functions that are being executed inside each of the nodes. So, so this means that we can actually do uh, stochastic gradient descent. Uh, so let's see how this will plug in. We have to just this is a neural net, it's the output of the neural net. We have to apply the loss function to it, right? So how do we turn that into a computation graph? And so let me just, uh, the important point here is that it's not just the evaluation of the neural net that we're computing gradients of, it's actually the loss function applied to the neural net, the output of the neural net, that's what we're computing a gradient of. So which means that the loss function itself has to be part of the computation graph because that's actually the function we wanna know the gradient of. We have to build in the loss function into the computation graph. So let me just end on a slide that just shows how this uh, can be done. So over here on the on the uh, lower left here, we have a neural net. It's a simple one. It has maybe just two input parameters, x1, x2. It does some computations. There's some steps that we cannot see here. There's some parameters sitting on the edges. And finally, let's say this neural net is just simple. The output function is an identity function. So it's basically going to compute some weights times the 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 signals that comes in, it's going to take some weight here, multiply it onto the value coming in on this edge. It's going to take some weight here, multiply it onto the value comes in here. It's going to sum them and output it. And let's say uh, the loss function here is least squared loss. So the loss that we're using is the difference between the prediction and the label y squared. So how do we turn this into a computation graph? Well, so this node here, the output of this node in the neural net, that's the term W of x1, x2, right? So, so this is kind of, so all this neural net here is doing, if we, could, if we constructed its computation graph, this would give us this function in here, the evaluation of the neural net. Uh, so, so what we can do now is to say, well, look at this neural net here. There's some computation graph that represents it, right? So this computation graph, right? The last thing that's happening in this identity is, right? You take this, you take a weight here, multiply it onto the value that comes in, the weight here, multiply it onto the other value, and then you sum it. So the last operation that's being performed in this computation graph is a sum, right? So basically, let's say that this is the node here that's the top of the computation graph. Beneath it, uh, in particular, at the bottom are all these uh, variables, both the input features and these weights W1 and W2. And if there are more weights, they're also going to be inputs in this computation graph. So they're sitting here as input nodes. There's a, lot, about a bunch of computations that are happening. And at some point, uh, this node up here is going to output the value of this neural net. So this is the computation graph of the neural net. Now we need to see that we can, we need actually the computation graph for the whole loss function. This is similar, right? Because we can just, uh, we need to subtract, we need to take this value and subtract off Y. So this is just a simple node here, right? It's a subtraction node that takes the left uh, argument here, one that comes in and subtract off the right argument. So here the Y, the, the label is also just a new input to the computation graph. Right? So this computes the subtraction. And then finally we have a node up here that squares, right? So this just squares its input. So this is a computation graph that includes the loss function. And as part of it, you'll find the computation graph for the neural net, right? So this neural net over here has a computation graph that's this other triangle and you then kind of just 
patch it into a bigger computation graph that also includes the loss function. So you can actually construct this computation graph that corresponds to the whole loss function, including the evaluation of the neural net. And now you can just use this backpropagation algorithm to compute partial derivatives with respect to W1 and W2, right? You can actually also compute with respect to the input parameters, but we're not gonna do it. Uh, these are not those we cannot change, right? Those are the input of the, these are the features, feature vectors and labels, but we can run the computation and compute gradients with respect to W1 and W2. Okay, so this is the basic idea. And then in the next video, we're gonna look uh, in more detail on actually just using this backpropagation algorithm for uh, fully connected feed forward neural networks.